The Wacky World of Lilo and Stitch In the 1990s, there was a sci-fi boom in Hollywood, with successful films like The Matrix, Men in Black, The Fifth Element, and Independence Day all being released within the decade. The public's growing interest in science fiction instead of fantasy had a huge impact on the film industry, and more and more sci-fi stories were pushed into production in the hopes of capitalizing on the popularity of the genre. Disney was no exception, and in the 2000s they made the decision to pivot from the tried-and-true fairy tale formula that had brought them success the previous decade in favor of action-adventure stories with a sci-fi twist. This led to the release of several animated sci-fi films, including Atlantis, The Lost Empire, Treasure Planet, Chicken Little, and Meet the Robinsons. This wound up becoming a rather lackluster time in Disney's animation history, with their films failing to find an audience or box office success. 2002's Lilo and Stitch was the exception, receiving both critical and commercial acclaim, and the popularity of the film and its characters inspired the company to create a full-fledged franchise around it, which included direct-to-video sequels, television shows, video games, various theme park attractions, a manga, and a graphic novel. While the vast majority of these projects followed the continuity of the original film, there were some exceptions, resulting in a fascinating yet confusing Stitch multiverse. With a live-action adaptation of the original film underway, in today's video we've decided to take a walk down memory lane and revisit the wacky world of Lilo and Stitch. We'll be taking a look at everything from the original film's production, to the franchise's numerous projects, to the disappearance and replacement of Lilo. Let's get into it. The beginnings for Lilo and Stitch started in the mid-1980s, with Chris Sanders, one of the eventual directors of the film, first developing the concept as a children's book. This idea never came to fruition, and after nearly a decade, it was retooled into what would become Lilo and Stitch. Unlike most of the other movies Disney was turning out around this time period, the project was purposely kept low budget and small, with then-CEO Michael Eisner relegating its production to Disney's Florida studio. This idea of offsetting costs with a cheaper project was inspired by Disney's 1941 production of Dumbo, which had a significantly lower budget compared to the studio's other films from that era. While you might have thought that this would have a negative impact on Lilo and Stitch, it actually did the opposite, with Lisa Poole, the associate producer, saying, quote, "...being in Florida, you were away from the mothership. If you needed support from LA, you had to holler a little louder, but that gave us freedom. There were definitely some things we did differently, and when LA found out, they didn't like it, but they couldn't argue with the results. Because the animation team had been moved to Florida, it was a relatively hands-off project, with the story being influenced not by studio heads and marketing teams, but by the creatives themselves. The majority of Disney's early 2000s animated movies were CGI heavy, but Lilo and Stitch instead paid homage to the company's history, sticking to traditional animation and using watercolors for the backgrounds, a technique which hadn't been used at the studio for several decades. The film revolves around two characters, Lilo Pelikai, a young girl living on the island of Kauai who, after the death of her parents, is being raised by her older sister, and Stitch, an alien experiment whose entire purpose in life is to wreak havoc. The two eventually meet, with Lilo believing Stitch to be a dog, and they develop a close bond, with Stitch becoming a member of her family. Lilo and Stitch premiered on June 16, 2002 opening in second place at the box office with $35.5 million. Although it dropped to third in its second week, the sci-fi comedy drama held its own against other summer blockbusters including Spider-Man and Star Wars Episode II Attack of the Clones. And by the end of 2002, it had become the second highest grossing animated film of the year behind 20th Century Fox's Ice Age. So what made Lilo and Stitch so special? Short answer, it had heart. That isn't necessarily rare for a Disney film, but its exploration of unconventional family dynamics was a far cry from the romance-driven storylines of Disney's most famous projects. Not to mention that it also stood out visually, looking totally unlike anything else Disney was releasing. Both of the film's main characters are misunderstood and misjudged in their own way. Lilo, an orphan, is considered the weird girl at school, and this loneliness results in her lashing out at others. Whether it's fighting with her classmates or running away, this mischievous behavior puts a strain on her relationship with her older sister Nani, and puts her status as Lilo's legal guardian at risk. Stitch's sole purpose, on the other hand, is to destroy everything in his path, and he doesn't understand the concept of love or family. These two troubled individuals are able to see the good in one another, and their bond becomes the cornerstone of the entire film. By placing focus on the Hawaiian concept of ohana, the film's central theme of family allowed it to appeal to a wider demographic, 
and whether you were a child, an older sibling, or a parent, there was something to identify with and love about Lilo and Stitch. What many people might not know about the film is that it was originally intended to take place in Kansas and follow the blossoming friendship between Stitch and a young boy. By moving the location to Hawaii, Lilo and Stitch was able to highlight a culture that the studio had yet to explore, and they did so in an incredibly respectful and loving way. While there had been other sci-fi films with young protagonists like E.T. and The Iron Giant, Lilo and Stitch was one of the first to have a girl as the main character, effectively subverting expectations of the genre. To this day, it's still difficult to find a female character in a sci-fi film that isn't just the male lead's love interest. Although the film's animation style and storyline are what made it an initial success, there's no denying that a large part of its enduring popularity is the adorableness of its lead character, with Stitch becoming one of Disney's most recognizable creations. Disney was well aware of the character's marketability from the get-go, with Stitch being featured prominently in promotional materials, significantly more so than Lilo. You probably remember the iconic interstitial commercials where the character made cameo appearances in other Disney films effectively ruining the moment by either breaking something or being generally obnoxious. As was custom at the time, the characters in Lilo and Stitch were also made into limited edition McDonald's Happy Meal toys, and I don't mean to brag, but I had all of them. Unsurprisingly, there were also an assortment of tie-in video games released alongside the film, with some even providing more insight into the world of Lilo and Stitch. Set before the events of the film, the PlayStation game Disney's Stitch Experiment 626 followed Stitch, then known as 626, as a galactic fugitive. After completing a mission to collect DNA, 626 fights one of Jumba's other experiments, after which Captain Gontu arrives and arrests the group, ending the game where the film begins. Disney's Lilo and Stitch was released that same year for the Game Boy Advance, and took place some time after the events in the film, following Stitch as he rescues Lilo from a mosquito-like alien named Dr. Pestis, who plans to use her as food for his mosquito army. The exploration and expansion of the Lilo and Stitch lore was continued in 2003's Stitch the Movie, the first of the franchise's multiple direct-to-video sequels. Although Lilo is no longer in the title, she's still just as much of a main character as Stitch, with the dynamic duo now setting out on a mission to rescue Jumba's other alien experiments, who are referred to as Stitch's cousins, tying into the themes of family introduced in the first film. A more straightforward sci-fi adventure, the film introduces an assortment of new characters like Dr. Hamsterveel and Experiment 65, aka Reuben, who later go on to make frequent appearances in the Lilo and Stitch TV series, which this film was effectively a pilot for. Because the film sheds light on Stitch's past, as well as Dr. Jumba's other scientific experiments, it winds up retconning the events in the Experiment 626 video game. Stitch the movie didn't fare as well critically compared to its predecessor, in large part because it was such an obvious setup for the TV show, but kids loved it. And in retrospect, I couldn't imagine a better way for Disney to tease their next project. On September 30th, 2003, a month after the release of Stitch the movie, Lilo and Stitch the series premiered on ABC, airing on Disney Channel a few weeks later. Picking up where Stitch the movie left off, the series followed Lilo and Stitch as they find and collect all of Jumba's missing experiments, changing them from bad to good, and finally, finding them new homes and families where they can feel like they belong. The series also brought back Captain Gontu as one of the main antagonists, who attempts to capture experiments of his own to bring back to his now boss, Dr. Hamsterveel. The series was fairly formulaic, with each episode featuring a new experiment with a wacky power and unique design. But that predictability was part of the fun. Having seen how successful Stitch merchandise was, these new characters were given similarly cute looks, and I remember arguing with my classmates about which experiment we'd like to have as a pet. Some of my favorites were Gigi, Hunka Hunka, Mr. Stenchy, and Clip. Besides Reuben, the most popular of the new experiments was without a doubt Angel, who was effectively the female version of Stitch, having a similar character design, just in pink. Her siren song gave her the ability to turn people or other experiments from good to evil, and because of this, she became a minor antagonist, resulting in her having more appearances in Lilo and Stitch the series than most of the other experiments. She and Stitch also develop a romantic relationship over the course of the series, an idea that they continue to explore in the franchise's future. At the time when the series was airing, DisneyChannel.com had become one of the most popular websites for kids, with dozens of Flash games being available to play which took inspiration from Disney's most popular shows like Kim Possible, That's So Raven, and The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. A brilliant form of advertising, the Lilo and Stitch games were nothing revolutionary, but with their unique Hawaiian aesthetic and cute characters, they were still popular, 
They also released games that featured the experiments that were introduced in the series, allowing kids to become familiar with them even if they weren't watching the show. These games included Alien Interception, a shooting game where Stitch had to capture experiments that had run amok, Jumba's Lab, which allowed you to design your own experiment, and Sandwich Stacker, where you had to control Reuben and balance different ingredients to make a sandwich. The latter is probably one of the website's best remembered games. Seeing the franchise's continued popularity, Disney decided to bring Lilo and Stitch to the parks, opening Stitch's Great Escape at Disney World on November 16, 2004. As part of the promotion for the attraction, the park was decorated to look as though Stitch had destroyed it, mirroring the concept in the interstitial trailers that they'd created for the first movie's release. Detailing Stitch's first prison escape, the attraction was met with mixed reception from guests, with the most common complaint being the chili dog burp that made many people nauseous. The attraction also had a meet and greet segment, with Stitch making a costumed appearance, and the character was eventually added to other Disney Park locations. Over the course of its 65-episode run, Lilo and Stitch the series included multiple crossover events, where Lilo and Stitch would encounter characters from Disney's other animated shows. This included Kim Possible, The Proud Family, American Dragon Jake Long, and Recess. Crossover episodes have long been the crown jewels of the Disney Channel, with the events giving fans a chance to see their favorite characters from various shows interact with each other. While these episodes are only considered canonical within the Lilo and Stitch universe, the Recess crossover technically causes a bit of a continuity issue, since that series takes place in the 90s, while Lilo and Stitch is set sometime in the mid-2000s. There was also another, less widely publicized crossover, and even though it didn't have any effect on the franchise's storyline, I feel like we have to mention it just because it's so bizarre. The animated short features Stitch and a few of his friends, who decide to challenge each other to a basketball game, before bursting into a dance number for We're All In This Together. Yes, the song from High School Musical. The animated short aired on Disney Channel Japan on June 18, 2007, and wasn't released internationally until over a year later. So if you had no idea this chaotic crossover happened, I don't blame you. While Lilo and Stitch the series was airing, the direct-to-video film, Lilo and Stitch 2, Stitch Has a Glitch, was released in 2005, and is the only movie in the franchise that is set between the events of 2002's Lilo and Stitch and 2003's Stitch the Movie. Serving as both a prequel and a sequel, the film's premise revolves around Stitch's past coming back to haunt him. Since Jumba didn't have time to fully charge Stitch's molecules before they were both arrested, the dangerous glitch in his system makes Stitch revert to his destructive ways, driving a wedge between him and Lilo. The movie essentially becomes a race to save Stitch's life, with the character realizing that although Lilo needs him, he needs her even more. This is personally my favorite of the Lilo and Stitch direct-to-video sequels, because even though it isn't loaded with action, I feel like it's the closest to capturing the heart of the first film. On the DVD release of the movie, there was the animated short The Origin of Stitch, which served as a bridge between Stitch Has a Glitch and Stitch the Movie, with Jumba telling Stitch how he was created and hinting at the existence of other experiments. Between 2002 and 2006, the magazine Disney Adventures released a number of comic strip tie-ins to the franchise. While some of the comics served as prequels, others took place during the events of the films and series. Most of these were fluff stories that had little effect on the main storyline, but in one case were introduced to a blue Reuben, an event that is later retconned. In June 2006, Lilo and Stitch the series concluded its three-year run with the film Leroy and Stitch, which served as a finale the same way Stitch the movie served as a pilot. In the film, Stitch, Jumba, and Pleakley are all rewarded for successfully finding and rehabilitating Jumba's experiments, and are given new statuses and jobs for their efforts. However, their new positions also means their inevitable departure from Earth and back into space, leaving Lilo behind in Hawaii. Meanwhile, Dr. Hamsterville breaks out of prison and creates an evil version of Stitch named Leroy, who is sent to Earth to destroy everything in its path and kidnap Jumba's experiments. Compared to the widely adored series, Leroy and Stitch received mixed reviews. Although it succeeded in wrapping up the events of the show neatly, many felt like it was a step backwards for the characters, with fans questioning why Jumba, Pleakley, and Stitch would be willing to leave Lilo for a job. Leroy and Stitch marked the conclusion of the franchise's main storyline, the one where Lilo is a main character and Hawaii its setting. But that wasn't the end of the Stitch franchise. Two years after the release of Leroy and Stitch, the franchise made its TV return, this time in an anime format produced in collaboration with the Japanese animation studio Madhouse. Stitch! Exclamation point, began airing in October 2008 and took the series in a totally new direction. 
Besides being set in Okinawa instead of Hawaii, it also phased out Lilo altogether, introducing a new character, Yuna Kamihara, who takes Lilo's place as Stitch's best friend. Occurring years after the events in Leroy and Stitch, Stitch has reverted back to his original destructive nature following a misunderstanding with Lilo, with Stitch believing that she's abandoned him for a boyfriend, when in actuality, she's just been at college. After crashing on the fictional island of Izayoi, he meets and befriends Yuna and is later reunited with Jumba and Pleakley, and they all wind up moving in with Yuna and her family, essentially repeating the events of the first film. In the first two seasons, Stitch sets out to do 43 good deeds in order to get a magical stone that grants wishes, hoping to become the strongest being in the universe. In the third season, Stitch and his family move to a city called Okinawa Newtown, where they're antagonized by villains who want to steal the source of Stitch's power. Now I'm sure you're wondering how Stitch landed an entire Japanese adaptation. Well, it's less complicated than you'd think. From the moment Stitch was introduced back in 2002, Japanese audiences fell in love with him, and they put their money where their mouths were, with the country making up a fifth of the film's total box office returns. The same way Germany loves David Hasselhoff, Japan loves Stitch, something owed to his cute, aka kawaii, appearance, and he's become one of the most heavily featured characters at Tokyo Disneyland. With several attractions devoted to the character, Stitch's popularity in Japan is only rivaled by Mickey Mouse and Winnie the Pooh. With more and more Lilo and Stitch media being produced throughout the 2000s, its fanbase continued to grow, and when Lilo and Stitch the series reached its conclusion in 2006, Japanese audiences quickly began clamoring for more Stitch content. Considering they already had tangible proof of Japan's support of Stitch, moving forward with a series that directly catered to this thriving market was a no-brainer, and the anime wound up airing between 2008 and 2012, with a special in 2015. Out of any other Stitch-related piece of media released at this point, this was by far the franchise's most unique project, with the series having a different art style, darker themes, and more mature storylines compared to its American predecessors. Dr. Hamsterveel, Gontu, and Ruben return as villains, and are eventually joined by a new antagonist, Delia, who I think looks like a character right out of Sailor Moon. A fully grown Lilo also makes an appearance in the series along with her daughter, Ani, who looks identical to her, with Stitch mistaking the young girl for her mother. After reuniting, Lilo and Stitch clear up their misunderstanding and reconcile, with Lilo promising to visit him again in the future, although we don't actually wind up seeing her in the series again. Because it takes place in the same continuity as Lilo and Stitch the series, each episode features one of Dr. Jumba's experiments, some old, some new. Although their appearance takes inspiration from Japanese legends, these new additions are still canon in terms of their names and functions, with Jess Winfield, executive producer of Lilo and Stitch the series, saying, quote, There is a master list of experiments. Although it's Disney property, I'm apparently the only one who kept a copy. I've shared it with the Japanese team, and they've used it extensively. Some of the original experiments from the series also make appearances in the anime because of their popularity amongst the fandom, including Angel, who officially becomes Stitch's girlfriend and is a recurring character in the anime. Her presence in the show made the character even more of a fan favorite, and Disney began to create more merchandise that featured her, to the extent that you could argue that she became more prevalent than Lilo. The character also began making costumed appearances in parks around the world, making her one of the only characters from a Disney sequel series to do so. While the series found success in Japan, it received mixed reception in other countries, especially America, with fans criticizing the removal of Lilo and the Hawaiian setting. Some fans have even gone as far as claiming that Stitch is non-canonical because it conflicts with the nobody gets left behind theme of the earlier entries, but neither the Walt Disney Company or franchise creator Chris Sanders have commented on the matter. Two years after the Stitch anime ended, Disney released the franchise's first Chinese animated spin-off, Stitch and I, which premiered in China with a Mandarin Chinese dub in March 2017, while the English language version aired a year later on Southeast Asia's Disney Channel. Stitch and I marks our first official entry into the Lilo and Stitch multiverse, with the series taking place after the events of Leroy and Stitch, but having nothing to do with the storyline introduced in the anime, creating an entirely new continuity. In the series, Stitch is given additional programming which allows him to transform into a giant monster that can wipe out entire solar systems. This information is leaked to the entire galaxy, and two rival alien factions set out to capture and use him for their own nefarious purposes. While attempting to escape from them, Stitch crashes into the Wangshan Mountains, where he meets a young girl named Ai Ling and eventually joins her family. Once again, Jumba and Pleak Lee return, with Jumba creating more creatures, who take inspiration from Chinese myths. 
This is the first Lilo and Stitch TV series where none of the other experiments appear, and where neither Gontu nor Dr. Hamsterveel are primary antagonists. The series garnered mixed to negative reviews, even amongst Chinese audiences, with fans of the franchise expressing disappointment at Lilo being replaced once again, although some praise was directed at the series' art style. Because of this lackluster reception, Disney didn't wind up renewing the series for a second season, and as a result, Stitch and I ended after only 13 episodes. As we already mentioned, Japan's love for Stitch knows no bounds, which led to one of the strangest entries into the franchise, Stitch and the Samurai. Released in 2020, the manga takes place in an alternate universe that has almost nothing to do with the original series. Stitch once again crashes into Earth, but this time in feudal-era Japan, where he meets an Oda Nobunaga-type warlord. Immediately smitten with Stitch's cute and cuddly appearance, the warlord takes him in, and begins acting as a doting pseudo-parent. Pleakley and Jumba also make a return in the manga, attempting to capture Stitch and bring him back to the Galactic Federation, but after losing their memories, they begin living together as husband and wife. Because of the alien's presence, the village's technology advances at an unprecedented rate, and before long, it becomes a futuristic city. Taking inspiration from other historical manga like A Chef of Nobunaga or Jin, Stitch and the Samurai has a hyper-realistic art style that differs from other media in the franchise. Primarily a gag manga, the characters are caricatures of themselves, with Stitch being more of an annoying and spoiled brat than anything else. The warlord, who believes Stitch to be a blue tanuki, a raccoon dog, is a stand-in for the franchise's Japanese audience, with the character being enamored with Stitch to the point that he's unable to get anything done. Following the manga came Agent Stitch in 2022. The first Western-produced work in the franchise since Leroy and Stitch back in 2006, the book picks up where the first movie left off. What's different is that Stitch is now a detective for the United Galactic Federation, where he's tasked with investigating extraterrestrial-related mysteries happening in various Earth cities. The first book, A Study in Slime, takes the character to Paris, where he and his friends attempt to uncover the disappearance of Cobra Bubbles. The second book, The Trouble with Toothoids, which is slated to be released later this year, brings Agent Stitch and his friends to New York City, where they have to save the day from a group of shape-shifting aliens. Written by Steve Bailing and illustrated by Ariana Rea, we see another art style change, with Stitch looking more human than dog-like. While I am intrigued by the concept, which I actually think could transition into TV pretty seamlessly, I do wonder how popular these books will wind up being. After all, with the first Lilo and Stitch movie coming out 20 years ago, how many kids today are even familiar with the little blue alien? I asked a similar question when Disney announced that they were developing a live-action adaptation of the first movie. Entering production in 2018, the film has already seen its fair share of hiccups, the pandemic being an obvious one. In November 2020, In the Heights director John M. Chu entered early negotiations to direct the film, but has since been replaced by Dean Fleischer Camp. The first script, written by Mike Van Wise, was rejected by Disney, who later tapped Chris Kekaniokalani Bright, a Hawaiian-born and based writer, for the project, a choice that I'm hoping steers the film in the right direction. Not much else is known about the upcoming remake, aside from the casting of Zach Galifianakis as Pleakley, but fans are already on the fence about the project, myself included. With Disney's live-action adaptations regularly falling flat, I'm not sure if they'll be able to capture the magic of Lilo and Stitch, especially if their main goal is a paycheck. But on the bright side of things, at least Lilo will be back. How much of the Lilo and Stitch universe have you seen? I hope you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon!